Hello and welcome back to Sparring Pod with me, Holger Gustavsen. Today I'm uh, a bit fanboy. Uh, I have to admit, I'm sorry about that, but uh, I have a very special guest today, uh, Chris uh, Chris Doe from the future. Uh, please welcome him. Here you go. Welcome, Chris. Hello, hello. Hi. Good to see you. Same. Uh, I'm so happy that you would uh, that you were able to join me today. Uh, you are a designer, uh, CEO, uh, YouTuber. You basically you touch on all the things my podcast uh, touch upon about creativity, marketing, entrepreneurship, uh, basically uh, content production, uh, everything. So to have you as a guest is amazing. Uh, thank you so much again. It's my pleasure. Uh, it really is. Thank you. Uh, in uh, in your own words, could you tell me uh, or the the viewers I have uh, a bit more about you? Uh, just what are your focus right now uh, between blind and the future? Sure. I, I like to describe myself as a loud introvert. That will tell you a little bit about my personality. And the future has this really big mission, which is to teach a billion people how to make a living doing what they love. In a former life, I was a graphic designer. I started my company in 1995 called Blind, and we made commercials and music videos for 20 plus years for some of the biggest brands and bands in the world. In 2014, a friend of mine, a former college classmate um, said to me, let's go make content on YouTube. <laughs> and I thought that was the dumbest, craziest <laughs> idea ever. And then I did it. Yeah. And in doing so, I transformed my life and my business. Now I do content creation full time. Mm -hmm. I no longer do client work and it's been a beautiful, glorious path. Your voice on YouTube, which is basically my my main source of uh, learning when it comes to uh, running a business and uh, marketing in general. Uh, your voice on the Internet basically encapsulates everything that m me in my company has learned but not vocalized in the last 10 years and how how are you able to vocalize it or to put words on it uh, the way you do how much time do you spend thinking about these things that's a great question um let me just figure out how to answer that question <laughs> <laughs> okay um, something that people need to know is about five years into my business i had a windfall of profit for that year and i asked my wife who also is my business partner that maybe we should spend some of this money on professional resources so that year we hired a cpa we hired a financial planner and i also hired a business coach and the business coach really is the person who transformed me and my thinking in terms of learning how to run a business uh, up until that point i was successful because of talent and hard work mm -hmm. but i hit a ceiling and that ceiling was just killing me so now I'm going to have to work on the things that nobody wants to work on, sales, marketing, leadership, a business mindset. And so for the next 13 years, I worked with this same business coach and would meet with him once a week for 13 years. So this so is way before work. I make my, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. a lot of hard work. <laughs> it's just way before I'm even thinking social media, before mm -hmm. I'm thinking YouTube. And so now fast forward to 2014, I run a business for, at that point, um, almost 20 years. And the number one thing that people would start to ask me about is, Chris, I want to start a business. What do I need to know? And I would answer <laughs> these questions one-on-one -on -one, over the telephone, yeah. doing things like that. But eventually I got tired of doing that. And I said to this one person, his name is Frank. I said, Frank, I'll answer your question if we can record it and do it live. He's like, happy to. And so to my surprise, when I did this uh, kind of content, it started to catch a lot of people's attention. I thought, who wants to tune into YouTube to see like an Asian bald guy talk about business and creativity? And it turns out actually quite a few people do want to hear about yeah. business. And so we found a place and a space that wasn't really, um, it, it wasn't uh, overwhelmed with lots of people talking about it. So I was happy to be one of a few people who are talking about the business of design. Yeah, yeah, because I, I have been a nerd all my life uh, and uh, listening to your uh, your podcast where you talked about you, it seemed to me like you also were kind of a nerd in your own space for quite some time. 
Uh, I have always thought uh, when you talked about having your portfolio and, and nobody asking to see your portfolio, but you wanting to see the other people's portfolio just to see if you were on par. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. I I really recognize that as something because I I really don't care about. I I know I do good work in marketing and stuff like that, but I want to see other people's results, other people's case studies. That is something that really ignites something within me to see: Am I on par with this? So that really resonated with me. How was that? Because uh, in uh, as you might understand, I I listened. To your uh, podcast about you before this so uh, how why were you interested in uh, how to measure up because you seem like a really bright guy it, it, i think there is a question there somewhere uh, i got the question i think yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> i'll try to answer if not redirect me okay mm -hmm. okay so i was led to believe that the school that i was going to was made up of mythical unicorns of creativity and when i got there i started to wonder where do i fit in this pantheon of design greats i'm talking about my classmates i'm not talking about the instructors no, no. yeah and and i came late to design um i started to become serious about it only like a year prior it wasn't like i i lived all my life saying i'm going to be a designer I actually didn't allow myself that thought and so i'm relatively inexperienced and i i grew up in Silicon Valley, there, there weren't a lot of great uh, creative resources for me, at least at that time. And so I thought, I don't know anything. And the best way to know is to find out and to be brave enough to ask. So I wanted to confirm my suspicion, which was, is this the, the world's greatest gathering of creative human beings or is it not? And so I, I dared to ask and people would show it to me and like, oh, it's a bunch of student exercises, not yes. that good. <laughs> shoot let me just try another one maybe this is an anomaly so mm -hmm. every person who's willing i would watch or would look at their portfolio and and that's how i started to understand like contextually this is where i fit yeah okay can, can i ask you how old you are because i uh, in my google search it said 32. yes but... I'm, I'm 49. yeah good <laughs> just a few years Cause, now. yes thank you because mm -hmm. i regarding that google search i was thinking he's 32 years old and he started his company in 95. wow that's that's young uh but but you're you're not <laughs> that amazing you're just amazing in another way yeah yeah good okay because i i started my my first company in 99 i was 17 year old and i bicycled to um uh, to a company uh, and i told them that you guys need to be on the web uh, at that time it was the web and i uh, and he said like yeah okay uh, tell me about this the web uh, and uh, he said <laughs> uh, okay this sounds like a good idea how how much does it cost and i was like oh sh shit how much does a website cost i don't know uh, so i just uh, threw out the largest number i could uh, muster and that was f uh, 1400 dollars approximately I was like, yeah, mm -hmm. okay. And the whole way bicycling back, I was like, I said the wrong number. I said too low number. He didn't even think about it. That was way too low. So that's where I understood, or that was when I started to understand what you always talk about to, to price things according to the value that you bring to the client. And that, that, but that has been so hard for me to actually put into words before I, I have seen the YouTube videos that you have done. Uh, if I can ask, in your past, what was the most defining for you getting to where you are now? Do you, do you see like one place or one thing that gets you on this path? There's several. And so it depends on which path you want me to talk about. But many paths aren't constructed from one singular act. Mm -hmm. It's a series of small acts that lead to that moment people say like what what is good fortune it's like being at the right place at the right time mm -hmm. so i add one more thing being at the right place at the right time in front of the right person and that doesn't happen without consistent persistent hard work and preparation yes. you manifest that opportunity <laughs> yeah. in into happening into reality when you when you're prepared so for me the big breakthrough was when i was able to do a national car commercial 
Okay. So once we did a national car commercial, everybody else would say, okay, you're legitimate. You know what you're talking about. We know how to sell you. We know how to work with you. And at that moment, our company blew up in, in, in wonderful ways. But before you can get that national car commercial, you have to do the regional car commercial. Of course. And before you can get that, you have to do something simple. And then you just keep tracing it all the way back. And usually, for a lot of things, I can trace it back to the singular act. And it all began when I was still in school. When there was this guy, his name is Jason Hoover. He's a friend of mine. He's an industrial designer. Uh, we're both poor. And so we're both trying to like trying to make it in the world. And, and he couldn't have finished his education, but I became friends with him. I tried in every way I could just to help him when he needed it. Mm -hmm. So Jason then later on introduces me to someone who then introduces me to someone. And then, you know, the rest of the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I don't if I don't, if I turn my back on this person, if I said, you know, you're just as broke as I am. I, I only <laughs> want to work with rich students. Yeah. I only want to help people who I know who can help me. Then none of this would have happened. So, but then if we pull it even further back, the, the values that your parents instilled in you basically made you do those things so you can take it even yeah yeah i understand right. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, if if you could travel back and uh, meet chris age 10 and you could say one you, you could talk to chris 10 uh, 10 years old uh, for half a minute what what would you tell him i would tell him there's just going to be this thing called youtube and social media to, <laughs> to to don't fight it to go into it as soon as possible you you won't know how to use it you you won't know when or or why just just start making content and then that way you can get an early start uh, this uh, christo at age 10 what things would you think that he would be the most impressed with uh, at at your present stage in life I, I, at the age 10? Mm -hmm. So the age 10 brain is just really not that mature. I can't okay. answer that question. Let's say from 15, age 15 then. Let's say no, 15. No, but I can, <laughs> I can answer it on a superficial level. Yeah. Like a teenager is going to be concerned about financial success, about mm -hmm. uh, fame, about uh, popularity, those kinds of things. And yeah. that 15 year old would probably be impressed at the reach in which the future has. And, mm -hmm. and the the number of lives we're able to touch and the deals that are happening today because of that and i think that person is going to have their brain melted like i just can't believe people pay <laughs> you to do this kind of stuff yeah. uh, do you think there's anything uh, in your life right now that uh, he would be embarrassed about well my 15 year old self too would is a very shy person who's mm -hmm. um, not comfortable speaking uh, to to even one-on-one -on -one situations and so that person would think like there's no way i there's no way i could be on camera there's no way i could be on stage and having so many eyes looking looking at me at that time so that's probably the thing that they would be most shocked by hmm. what kind of things do you have in your life right now or your personality that you wish to be able to take with you to the future to become a, an old Chris uh, and I look back and see, okay, I managed to take a hold of this uh, part of me and, and stay stick with it. Uh, well, I, I think my, uh, the thing I'd like to never lose is my curiosity, my love for learning and my love for helping other people. And that, that gives me uh, very selfish, genuine joy. And I, I think it's a human nature thing. Yeah. I think sometimes we've moved away from this idea. Like I got a message from somebody today and, and they said something like, I don't have a business without the things that you've shared. You've yeah. helped me to transform from going from a $500 logo to a $20,000 logo or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it makes me really happy to see that, that in, in our connected society, that an idea that's transmitted from here in Los Angeles out into the universe wherever it hits it hits some mm. some person some man some woman somewhere and it changes their path yeah sometimes negatively it's sometimes positively cool uh your uh your agency is named blind uh and in your um capabilities deck there are some words about the the background of that name uh would you like to explain the the reason behind blind Sure. 
there's there's a lot of different explanations that I'll give you both. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when, when I grew up, I loved skateboarding, and there was a company uh, called Vision, and Vision was a corporation, <laughs> and they had lots of money. And then these skaters formed a company also called Blind, just as a parody brand. And I always <laughs> loved that. So later on, when I went into my business, I was thinking, you know what? I don't know how long I'm going to be in business. I'm going to start a design company and let's come up with a name that's very provocative, something that's going to be kind of anti what you would think, anti-logic, illogical. And so we said it's going to be called blind, but it's also married with our design philosophy, mm -hmm. which is I don't believe in having a strong personal style that I impose on my clients. So we say we don't begin the project without you. We begin without preconceived ideas or notions. We begin without prejudice. We begin without assumptions. We begin blind. And that's that's the meaning we tell our corporate friends. Can can I uh, tell you uh, one of the questions uh, me in my agency ask new designers in the interview process is that, is it very important to you to put your spin your your feelings and uh, and thoughts on the work we present to our clients and if they answer yes then the interview is over <laughs> uh, because yeah because yeah and that has been as i've been in the company for six years now uh, and i i was told that when i started it's like we work for the client we we do not uh, put our uh, stamps or our feelings on the client's work because it's supposed to be for the client uh, and then when i see that in your capabilities deck also i'm like yeah this is this is uh, this is actually not something that you have thought about or that i have thought about this is just how it should be in my mind <laughs> if you understand what i mean absolutely yeah. I think it goes, uh, depending on the industry and the field that you practice, mm -hmm. um, having a strong personal style can be an asset and can also be a detriment. So photographers, they need a strong yeah. personal style. Uh, illustrators and artists generally need a strong personal style where you can look at it and say, that's, that's that person's work. And they're going to get hired because of that because that's what makes them unique and different. Design is a little bit different. Design is like, you know what? I have a set of skills. And I'm going to help solve a problem. And sometimes my personal preferences for things that I like are going to go against this solution. And so in this case, yeah. for me, I want to have lots of tools in my arsenal and I want to be able to design the thing that is most appropriate for the, for the uh, client and also the thing that's most likely to help them achieve their goal. Yeah. Can, can I ask you, what do you think? Or... No, uh, my my logo here. How'd you make it bigger? Uh, no, I did like this. It's an oh, H when you move out. An, an uh huh. G. Uh huh. Uh, and also the the, <laughs> the hand going like that. Yeah, is, is that the hang loose symbol? Yeah, or yeah. rock rock on or something. Oh no, rock and roll. Yeah, rock, rock and roll. roll right, yeah. yeah. So I, I tried to in incorporate all of that into uh, my own uh, HG, HG brand. So this this is just a simple logo. I uh, what is the the coolest client work you have done? The thing the project I love the most was a music video, and it was done for the Ravenettes. And I've done two music videos for them, and mm -hmm. it's the most joy. And it was the hardest work I've ever had to do, <laughs> and mostly because. It was a client that gave us a very open brief and they had ah. very little input on it because not because they didn't uh, have the right to it's just two artists work together they respect you to do your thing yeah. and that creates immense pressure because you know when things don't work out from a client that's very controlling you could always tell the team yeah it wasn't as good because <laughs> they made us yeah. do this right yeah. but when the artist says do whatever you want if it's not good who are you going to blame <laughs> you just blame yourself yeah. so it's an immense amount of pressure and it's also a great opportunity so we got to play we got to explore we got to make art and to get paid for it, and i got to be seen by lots of people hmm. and so for me those two music videos for the ravenettes are my favorites cool uh, how how do you come up with ideas what kind of process do you have mm -hmm. i have a very specific process it's borderline rigid 
Mm-hmm. I like to think of it as if you listen to mu- musicians, artists, yeah. um, the ones that understand a process, their, their creative formula, are able to make hit after hit. And the ones who luck into it, they're called one hit wonders. One hit wonders, yeah. Yeah, they for whatever reason they got together and they made this really amazing piece of music and they have no idea how they got there. Mm. I'd like to consider myself as a person who's not a one hit wonder who can do something and have predictable and repeatable success. And in order for that to happen, uh, you have to figure out some kind of creative process or formula. So for me, almost always, it begins with understanding what the problem is. And you need really strong uh, focus and clarity from the client. Like the solution sounds like this in, in just words. Like, can we commit to two or three words? Once I have that, <clears throat> I go into research mode and I have uh, usually a team of designers working for me. I, I will say uh, it's about beauty. It's about sacrifice. It's about whatever the words are. I want you to find images, art, uh, still frames, photography, illustration, videos, on anything that you think relates to this. And we create these gigantic buckets. And so if I have a team of designers, there can be literally hundreds of things in each one of these buckets. And I can quickly scan through them like, I like this, I like this. And then I let my imagination take over. Like based on the theme of love, uh, this image is speaking to me. And I'll go away and I'll sit down and like, why? And I'll write some ideas down. I'll try to create a story around that. And then I give that story back to the designers and I said, find me images that tell this story and we start to shape the story together. That's typically how I work. Yeah, and then this uh, goes out into uh, uh, one of these long boards. Oh, stylescape? Stylescapes, yeah. Yes. D- does these things turn into stylescapes or uh, have I misunderstood the process? Okay, if I'm doing brand identity design work yeah. for a client, the process is a little bit different. Okay, I was, yeah. I, I'm sorry, because I was thinking music videos and commercials. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, you have to write a story, and so it's a little different. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah so, I understand. So, uh, yeah. okay, so in music videos, then you you kind of think up the story based on images, based on words. Uh, yeah, but themes. in mm-hmm. yeah, in uh, in client work with uh, brand styles brand yep. uh, then different you, process yeah that's a different let me explain that one yeah, yeah please okay so when i'm doing branding brand identity design it almost always begins with a facilitated discovery session with the clients we sit down we understand who the users are what the mm-hmm. end goal is and what the brand attributes are their tone and voice and look and feel and we we just use mostly words then we create a customer journey map about how our ideal client is going to become aware of us, how they form interest and desire, and what ultimately causes them to take action. And in doing so, we have a pretty good roadmap of all the deliverables that need to be built in order for this customer journey to to manifest itself. Okay, so we go back to the studio and I say, okay, I'm going to write the internal positioning statement for this brand, and here are their goals, and here are the keywords that define them their their tone of voice and their look and feel. And then what happens is they start to build the stylescapes for me. And I also collaborate with a copywriter to start to figure out how does this brand sound? What's the voice? How does it, how do, how do they express their personality? And so we were working in concert with each other. So the stylescapes start to get built and then we get those approved by the client and a stylescape for people who don't understand that, that terminology, think of it as a mood board that's highly curated and assembled in such a way that it feels like somebody spent weeks designing you in a comprehensive design system. It, it involves uh, textures, colors, materials, packaging, typography, signage, kind of everything that we think fits the brand. And then we, we present that to the client. They typically just pick one. Sometimes they have small notes, but if we're doing our job, if we're like really good at listening, listening. then we're not that far off, right? It's usually 85% there. They'll, they'll say like, that doesn't feel like the right demographic. So if you can change the person, that's too cool. That's too aspirational. So we pull it back a little bit. From that, we actually then begin the design process. Now we're kind of being able to look into the future. The client's already pre-approved the general direction. Yep. And now the designers can really sit there and refine and draw a beautiful logo, build out textures and patterns and build out the entire identity system. Uh, what What is the best idea you ever had? Uh, if you could like have a the best idea from Christo. 
Mm. Uh, in terms of client work or just no just just the best idea uh, okay it's starting with youtube uh <laughs> then uh yeah the best idea yeah okay the best idea i have is the current idea i'm working on right now which is to build a content and education company mm -hmm. talking about things like design topography logos but also the business aspect like sales and marketing and negotiations because my my dream is to share some of this success that I've been able to achieve with others in the way that they can feel empowered to achieve it on their own. Oh, I love that. Uh, I, uh, I, I try to make, uh, I, what I do mostly is working with marketers, uh, and, uh, helping them. Uh, well, what I want to do is to help them actually show the value of the work that they are doing because in my experience uh, most of the marketers i work with they are overworked with people that actually don't understand marketing around them thinking that marketers just wibble their wands and then something magical happens uh, and they don't always get to show the return on investment of what they do so that's that's kind of my pet peeve what i i love doing but uh so what you're doing also i've i've taken a couple of your courses and i think the way you do things are really good uh if uh, for everyone watching just go to uh yeah, i'll i'll paste the link actually so people can see but uh if if you tell a bit more about uh how you are building this uh for people uh, and why did you want to do this well, before I made my first YouTube video, I had been teaching at Art Center for, I think at that point, maybe 11 years. Yeah. And it's some of the, my happiest moments, which is to come into a classroom to deal with uh, 10, 12 hungry students, hungry minds wanting to know, and the push and pull between the tension and the solution, the resolution, those kinds of things make me really happy. Hmm. And the reason why I love teaching so much is, and, and this sounds like a cliche, but but I've always learned more from my students than I've ever taught them. So when they ask questions about what it is that I'm thinking about, they make me examine my own thought process, my own biases, and to be able to explain that to them in a way that they can achieve similar results or ideas. And it's, it's a really wonderfully exhausting, beautiful thing because for five hours we sit together in a room with lots of sticky notes and whiteboards and drawings and just working together and trying to share some of what I've learned in the last X number of years to help mm -hmm. them. But the problem with all that stuff was it's a fairly short lived finite experience. I teach yeah. for 14 weeks, it's five hours a week and then it's over and you touch the lives of maybe 10, 12 students at a time. The people if you're lucky, the if they're room, all paying basically. attention. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And then you repeat the entire process again the next semester and you just do it over and over. It changes, it evolves, but essentially it's the same. Yeah. So my wife had challenged me. She's telling me like, why don't you try and teach more people? There's more for you. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know that she was thinking YouTube, but she was just thinking, you're a smart person, figure it out. <laughs> figure it out and so yeah. then I have to go in and have to think about that. Like, what can I do, right? What can I do to be able to expand on this? And then getting into making content on YouTube was just the beginning. And I love the process. I love the process of teaching. I wish I didn't have to make money. I, I yeah. wish that YouTube or Disney or somebody would just say, you know what, we, <laughs> we think what you're doing is fantastic. We're just going to give you a few million dollars so that you can do this to employ your team and for you to be able to su support your, your life and your family. I think that'd be wonderful. And unfortunately that's not the case, not yet. No. <laughs> so then we have to make courses in order to capture some of the um, attention that we've garnered and also to, so that people can reciprocate. People watch the channel, they're like, I don't really need to learn this, but I'm just going to buy this course because I know it supports you. And, yeah. I, and I say to that, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. And you don't set low goals for yourself either because uh, your, no. your goal is 1 billion. Mm -hmm. that, that's a lot of people. It is. Yeah. <laughs> How it's far like one in eight you? people. Yeah, yeah. I'm How very far, far away from now? it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm, so, but I'm guessing we we are. It, it, 
touching more people today uh figuratively of course uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <so laughs> figuratively for sure yeah. <laughs> what <laughs> not, yeah, no, i'm not talking to anybody i promise you <laughs> what what is the worst idea we have ever have done oh you know on the way to to having a successful idea you have many mistakes and many failures and yeah. we try things all the time that just don't work and i don't really put them into the category of failures i just put them into the category of necessary lessons for success and so it's hard for me to be able to like what is a giant failure the, the know, least but... least pleasant learning experience then <laughs> sure the least pleasant learning experience for me was early on in my career when i'm i'm doing client work and i i have a, a very strict a delivery deadline Mm -hmm. And the clients were still making changes the night before, which put oh. me in a terrible position. Yeah. And then there was a problem of rendering uh, because I'm doing animation. And so now I have to go and finish the work. So I'm working all night and I, this is a really bad decision. I decided to go to sleep. Yeah. So I'd yeah. been working until like two or three in the morning. I was exhausted trying to, and I went to sleep and I woke up in two hours and I checked the machines and the machines weren't working properly. Some of them had crashed. And so the deadline was on us. And so, and one other thing, we were moving that day. So my, <laughs> my wife do, had, yeah. yeah, it's just everything that could go wrong, goes wrong. So these professional movers are in our office space, boxing things up while I'm frantically working on the computer. And I could just feel this stress seep out from my pores and just all over my face and body. My And get this. I'm working on the renderings while on the floor because they're taking away the desk. They're taking away the chairs because I don't want to move that later. So I have a little milk crate cartons or boxes and I have my, my monitor on it and, and a, and a mouse and the, the and the, the keyboard on the floor trying to, <laughs> to manage six different computers. It was probably my worst professional experience ever. Yeah. Did you deliver on time? I did not deliver on time. No. No, it was late uh, it, it was full listen. of mistakes and it was just an yeah. embarrassing professional experience it sounded like but but then again it's also in in cases like that i so much want to scream to the client well don't change it <laughs> we, we, this is yeah but yeah we've all been there yeah. i guess <laughs> yeah that's not really the client's problem it's my problem yeah. uh, i take 100 100 responsibility i i didn't manage the project well yeah. first I, yeah. I shouldn't, I, you know, knowing that there's a move on the same deadline day was, is horrific. Mm -hmm. I probably should have just paid for a second set of movers to come when I was ready, but I was already kind of in a desperate situation and I wasn't thinking clearly. So everything that could go wrong went wrong that day. Yeah. Uh, what, yeah. Ki what kind of things inspire you in everyday life then? Uh, generally people inspire me. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when I hear uh, someone struggle, uh, they're trying to get through a problem and I, I just hear that they want to solve solve that and and when they find the solution they take massive action I just sit back and like wow I just so I'm in awe of people who who have a problem who don't quit who are then able to find an answer and then without too much hesitation just go for it and then to transform their lives that is, that is very inspiring to me uh, but where do you uh, or do you think there is like a, a line where if you have tried something and like the people that somebody should tell them on like American Idol that actually, uh, Chris, you shouldn't sing in public or something like that. Uh, the, the people that because I'm inspired by people that that have this tenacity and this grit, but some people I think maybe should have a little bit less grit or try different things uh, where how can you s tell people that in a nice way and and where is that line do, do you have any thoughts around that mm. i do i don't think it's my place to tell people what they should and shouldn't be doing <laughs> unless unless they ask me uh, yeah if, they, if you yeah. ask me then i'll ask you one more question are you sure you want to know what i think and feel like truly or you want me just to say good job like no really let me have it I'm like and then i'll let you have it but i think there's this thing that we we sometimes fall into this trap where we think because we enjoy doing something that people should pay us to do it sometimes it works out 
Sometimes mm -hmm. it doesn't. And in that case, it's okay to love doing something even if you suck. If you love singing, if singing gives you a lot of joy, yep. but you can't carry a tune and you're off key, sing all to your heart's content, but don't <laughs> expect that you're going to be the next pop star. Mm. And that's okay. So do something because you love it uh, and, and stick with it. And it's totally okay. You can play guitar all of your life and be terrible, but if it gives you joy, do it. Then we have to find a way to make money. And then we yep. have to hopefully develop a skill so that people will pay us to do that thing. What what things uh, like mainly do you think that you inspire mostly in other people? Um, from from what I can tell from the feedback, they they like a couple of things. They they like how I simplify problems, how I speak clearly, how I have a very strong opinion about something, and that means some people like that and some people don't like that, but. I'm clear about where I stand on certain things. And in a, in a very confusing world where everything's gray and everything can work, having someone who's like, it's this or it's that, but it can't be both, is refreshing for people. Mm. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, now I have 20 quick questions. These are rapid fire. Okay. Uh, the, right. the answers doesn't have to be a rapid fire, but uh, the, okay. the questions will be. Okay, what I'll try my best. What is your most marked characteristic? Uh, my stoicism. I love that. Uh, what quality do you like most in a person? Honesty. What do you value most in your friends? Loyalty. What is your principal defect? I, I, I think... Oh my gosh, my, my worst defect. Uh, sometimes um, I, 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 I don't understand and process my emotions. Do you study stoicism uh, like fr from the question before? I do not. Have you tried? Um, I read one book. Okay. What? And uh, I'm, I'm curious about it. Yeah. It was the, the book, The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday. Okay. Cool. Uh, I have yeah. started uh, reading um, uh, Stoicism uh, about Stoicism, and there is a book called "A Guide to the Good Life" by William B. Irvine. Uh, I can send you a link. It mm -hmm. takes Stoicism into mod how to utilize Stoicism into modern life, and I really appreciate that uh, way of thought. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your favorite occupation? Teaching. What is your dream of happiness? Teaching a billion people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, in what in your mind, what would be your greatest misfortune? Um, failure to teach a billion people. <laughs> How would you like to be remembered? Having taught a billion people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I love yeah. teaching. And yeah. I'm frustrated because the the building the business part gets in the way of the teaching part. Like yeah. I need to make money. I need to be a team, and I like to grow my team and scale our efforts, and to be able to bring in many teachers. So there's a lot of pressure that I put on myself for the business model to succeed. Do you use digital marketing and paid ads and stuff like that to reach more people? We do, but we're not good at it. We don't know how to run ad campaigns apparently so we're, we need to work on that yes if you want i can teach you uh, and <laughs> and that is something we really uh, work with a lot so uh, yes uh, in what country would you like to live i like living where i'm at right now uh, unless things continue to go downhill uh, <laughs> i love america I, yeah. I love living in santa monica because because of the temperate climate because uh, entertainment capital of the world and the opportunities that exist here but i do love to travel as well uh what is your favorite color does black count as a color or do you want a real color uh, i think black counts as a color uh and i also have to say i i really enjoy your style also uh the the absence of hair and uh, a cap which uh, encapsulates the uh, nakedity of the skull i really enjoy that uh, mm -hmm. that's what i'm aiming for as well um yeah who is your favorite writer mm. 
or uh, probably Edgar Allan Poe um, for that noir noir genre. And I yeah. also like I- Isaac Asimov for science fiction. Cool. Uh, who is your favorite fictional hero? Uh, the Incredible Hulk. And I like the Hulk because he's got he's tormented by people. He's got multiple personality disorder and he can be most the most brilliant person when he's a human, mm-hmm. sometimes cold. Mm-hmm. And he can also be one of the most powerful people as the Hulk. Cool. I, I like that. Uh, I th- I don't know if it was you who uh, helped me uh, understand the thing introvert, outrovert thing. Uh, but when you uh, when I wrote, uh, read that you are a loud introvert, because I, I understood, I thought for myself that I was an extrovert all my life. Uh, but my mom has told me that all the time when I was younger, when I was like out in public and having old friends over. And when I was alone, then I was like a wreck. I was totally empty of all forms of energy. So I had to like store up afterwards. Uh, but I didn't connect that to being like introverted. Uh, but now I understand that I, I, I need some alone time also to be able to actually, I, I wouldn't say perform, but to interact with other people. Do you feel the same way or is do you have to like charge your batteries to be able to perform? Yeah, so I think um, I am the same way, but there is such a thing I think people have been describing as an ambivert. So you're somewhere in the middle and I, I don't think it's possible to change who you are, but I feel like I'm changing because my default is to stay at home, not to go out. And if I'm around people, then afterwards I'm going to take a nap because I'm like right now I'm tired. I've had three calls this morning and I want to go lay down really soon. But when, when I'm doing um, a talk and I'm in a foreign city, um, I'm out there doing the talk and then I'm happily going to the after parties and the gatherings because I I want to meet people. I want to talk to them and hopefully I can answer the question. So I don't know. I get energized by that now. So it's kind of a weird thing. Yeah, I, I have I've been doing live action role playing games all all my life almost. Uh, mm-hmm. And the way I see it, I I put on a role as a really uh, engaged extrovert. And I say to myself, OK, I'll get game face on. And then I'm this character that really enjoys and I, I kind of I enjoy talking to people also, but I find it really tiring at lengths. But I, I put on the game face and I, I do the do the things and then I have to just lay down afterwards. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Who is your favorite music- musician? Right now, I'm loving um, the band Twenty One Pilots. Uh, it's not my favorite, but I'm I'm just I'm really just admiring this that one person can can write the song, the lyrics, and perform all the parts, and it's super impressive. But I also love his ability to go on stage and 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 really produce a show that's engaging for the audience. And so I'm, I'm just impressed by this young man. Cool. Uh, I'll check it out. Uh, who is your favorite artist? Um, who's my favorite artist? Shoot, I should know this. <laughs> I, I, you know, whenever you put the word favorite, it means yeah. that for some reason yeah. the others are not as and it's really tough. Like for a long time in my life, I really admired the work of Pablo Picasso and the how playful he was in interpreting things and so revolutionary in, in co-inventing cubism. And I love that. But then as I get older, I'm like, okay, I'm over Picasso. Like who else? I'm into a lot of different people now. Like Damien Hirst and his conceptual thinking with his fine art. I, I love his installations and and just taking mundane things and just making them super, super interesting. I think that's yeah. what art is. Yeah, I think so too. And uh, I, I've had this same question for a long time. I, I, I'm not sure who my favorite artist is, but uh, I, as I told you earlier, I'm a huge nerd, uh, and uh, I've been watching Doctor Who since 2005. Uh, and there is in some some season of the newer Doctor Who, there is an episode where he travels back in time and visits um, uh, Van Gogh. 
have you seen this episode? No. Okay, he goes back and meets Van Gogh solving some space-time continuum uh, thing there. But Van Gogh is in this episode and I think also in his real life so tormented, so mm -hmm. depressed. So he and this uh, actor that portrays him, it's uh, I feel the chills coming on just thinking about it because he's so he's a wreck. And the, the last thing the doctor does while uh, as, as a kind of service to Van Gogh is to take him forward in time and taking him to see the Van Gogh Museum or the, the wing of the, the Museum of Fine Art or something like that. And that scene, it's so amazing. I would recommend everyone just uh, watching it because he asked the curator while Van Gogh is standing with his back turned and he says, could you, could you tell what what do you think about Van Gogh and to see how he describes his painting and feelings and how he reacts to that it's yeah it's one of my favorite uh, tv series moments ever uh, and also with like an, a person that actually existed but didn't go forward in time as far as we know uh, <laughs> yeah uh, that was a uh, real uh, we, I call it pigtail thought. Uh, so I just go. Yeah. What do you most dislike? Sorry. What do I most dislike in in yeah. general in, or in general? Yeah. You know the thing that uh, t obviously there are a lot of big problems in the world, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to focus on that. I'm, no. I'm trying to give <laughs> a very personal answer. I, I I generally have issues being around people who don't truly understand themselves and are wearing a mask pretending to be someone else because I can usually see who they are and it's difficult for me to to be around people like you know I see you it'd be nicer if you just stop pretending to be someone else and so there's that that friction that exists cool who are your heroes in real life my heroes are my parents uh, my, my both my dad and mom for the the lessons they taught me my dad about hard work persistence living humbly, uh, uh, delaying gratification for long-term goals. I learned that from my dad. My mom has this super beautiful, passionate spirit. She's creative. She's adventurous. She's bold. I, I, I wish for her, and obviously this is an empty thing, but I wished for her that when she was a young woman that she was born to different parents and grew up in America where things were possible because she would be a very different person today. Hmm. What natural gift would you most like to possess? Um, speed reading. <laughs> what vice do you have that you like to give into? I like to give into like yeah yeah. yeah. Okay, so I have yeah I have an obsessive personality. Uh, when I get into something, I forego most things and I just go really deep. And I know sometimes that's not healthy. Uh, yeah. And the example of this would be like a kid who plays a video game who forgets to go to the bathroom and then pees it on himself. Yeah. I'm not that extreme, but you know, it's I really close. get into stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah it's close. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, how would you like to die? Um, I, I would like to die um, um, around my loved ones and knowing that uh, I, I, I did more good in the world and that I, I gave more than I took. Thank you. That's that's nice. Uh, thank you so much for joining me on my podcast, Chris. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. The lightning round questions are tough, man. Yeah, it's not tough. supposed to be easy. Uh, <laughs> would uh, could you stick around for a couple of minutes and we'll just play the yeah. outro and go offline? Uh, to everyone watching, thank you so much. Uh, check out uh, Chris and uh, of. I'm guessing most of you already have, but yeah, still uh, have a good day and we'll talk suddenly.